Welcome, McDougallers all over the world. And uh, my name is Gustavo Tolosa. I'm here in Dallas, Texas. Um, I am the webinar specialist and host for Dr. McDougall and Chef AJ. Uh, some of you also know that I am a concert pianist and teacher who lost about uh, a little over 70 pounds about three years ago attending the 10-day uh, living program in Santa Rosa, California, and I have kept them off. I regained my health, and now I have a passion for bringing you this life-saving information. And today we have a very special guest. Before I introduce him to you, um, I want to announce that this webinar is being recorded as usual, and it will be available at uh, drmcdougalls.com. And I would like to take just a minute while everybody is logging in. We, I see a lot of people logging in right now. And I want to show you the uh, website here under education. You can see the live with Dr. McDougall online webinars. And you can see all of the past webinars available for you to watch any time of the day. And you always have the new webinars where you can sign up uh, for the current week or the next week. Just notice that next week we have another guest, Dr. Um, Doug Lyle, and he is giving another one of his great presentations called Dare to be lousy so it's really intriguing and let's see what else we have here then after that we will have dr john mcdougall back i do want to point out that under programs there is a three-day advanced study and i'm sorry a three-day intensive program coming up very soon in may and i am excited to that i will be in santa rosa and then there is another um 10-day living program coming up as well in June, and I want to encourage you to attend. Those are truly uh, life-saving and changing events, and I hope that you will be able to, to attend. So I will stop sharing the screen. And uh, today we have Dr. John McDougall's son, Dr. Craig McDougall, and um, what can we say? I will allow, I will let him go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about his background, um, where he's been working up to now and his new practice. Welcome, Dr. Craig McDougall. We're very excited to have you here today. All right. Thank you, uh, Gustavo. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, be able to be on this webinar and share with you a little bit about what I've been up to. Um, so, um, as Gustavo said, I'm a physician, um, so I'm a board-certified internist. I uh, went to Ohio State for medical school, um, and then I went to came out to Oregon, and I went to um, Oregon Health and Sciences University for internal medicine. After I graduated from internal medicine, I went to um, work at Kaiser Permanente in the Northwest region. Um, I was there for about three years. Um, at there, I had a, the wonderful opportunity to start a um, new type of clinic there, um, and I was a co-developer for a lifestyle medicine clinic that we saw people and helped them um, get off medications, lower their blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugars, um, really improve their health um, using a, a whole food plant-based diet. Um, while I was there, um, in the last year that I was there, um, what, why I actually ended up leaving was that I was approached by a different company within the um, Portland, Oregon area and they asked me to come and uh, lead up their primary care division um, at a company called Zoom Plus, um, formerly known as Zoom Care. Um, they're a company that used to be a do uh, just urgent care. And they've done urgent care in the Portland area and Seattle area for the last 10 years. Um, and in the last year, they expanded to um, provide complete care. And so they, they started their own insurance, um, primary care, pediatrics, uh, specialty care, um, and also their urgent care as well. I'm, I'm probably missing something. I think, uh, we also have a super clinic, which is like an ER. But so at the primary care um, division that I'm uh, leading up is I'm started up started up a clinic for primary care for adult medicine, 
And we wanted to really do things a little bit differently than what's been done before. Um, and, you know, the way that I, kind of my background and the mentors that I've had, I've kind of learned thing, learned to do things a little bit um, a little bit differently than probably has done in most primary care practices, um, which is taking, um, you know, a more conservative approach, uh, you know, a evidence-based approach, um, and really trying to use food and movement first before resorting to pills and procedures. And so that's kind of the foundational philosophy that um, I'm building this practice with. Um, and then we also um, want to help those people that need a little bit extra help, um, the patients who come and see us um, for primary care that need a little bit extra help, so we developed a program, um, an outpatient program that we do here that helps people um, implement more whole plant foods into their diet and move them across the spectrum towards a whole plant food, uh, plant-based diet to help them prevent or even reverse chronic conditions. Um, so in our program, we do uh, one-on-one visits um, with people. And so I uh, meet with people on a weekly basis to help with support and guidance and kind of give them a little bit more structure. Um, we go, you know, we start with kind of the basics. We go to the grocery store, um, talk about food label reading. We talk about eating out and we talk about meal planning as well. And these are also incorporated with um, group visits and our group visits are focused on um, more the practical of, um, of preparing these foods. And so we have four different group visits. Uh, one of them's about uh, focused on kind of like basics, like stocking the pantry, stopping, stocking the refrigerator, and also talking about uh, making uh, familiar flavors and sauces, um, dressings, kind of oil-free dressings, and also plant-based milks, making your own plant-based milks. Um, and then our other three classes are centered around uh, different starches. So we have a, a class centered around legumes, and a, set, a class centered around whole grains, and also a class centered around uh, root vegetables. And those, uh, each one of those classes are going to reinforce the same type of uh, um, topics that we talk about in our one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, and, um, and then those are going to also rotate seasonally as well. So every season will be a different, different recipe and a different featured root, legume, or uh, whole grain to help kind of keep people that support um, an ongoing connection um, for returning to um, uh, the program. So that's kind of like the, um, the overall kind of structure of um, what we're doing um, at our clinic. Um, and, you know, things are going well. We're, uh, we're expanding our hours and expanding our days because um, we're starting to get to that point where we can expand our practice. Um, I'm hiring another full-time provider to work with me, and I also have a, a part-time provider. And then uh, brought on a dietitian to help me with the group classes as well. So... Now, people uh, overall, I think, are responding very well to kind of our approach. I wouldn't say that everybody is necessarily ready to adopt a plant-based diet, but that's okay. We're there to, you know, to help uh, everybody. Um, and, you know, and not everybody necessarily needs a, a the more intensive program, too. So we do, you know, we, we do, you know, a lot of just kind of general primary care and helping support people, but still trying to encourage them to make lifestyle changes as our primary uh, starting place. Very, very good. good. Very good. Very good. I, I think I'm moving to Portland. <laughs> what a wonderful uh, program you have. We can hear a little echo because I don't know if you could turn down your volume. Yes, I can. Uh, yes, uh, that way it doesn't come out. Okay, very good. Um, how, do, how do you, uh, how can people contact you who live in the area and would like to uh, become your patient? Do you have a website, email, Facebook, phone number? Um, I think the best way is probably um, online. Um, the one of the things that the tenants that they you know use that they're um, in this company is really on-demand scheduling. So people can schedule on their phone or schedule online um, whenever they'd like. So it's um, like the appointments are always like the same day appointments, and um, and for on-demand scheduling for everything that we do, the same with the primary care as well. So if people go to zoomcare.com. Um, they can find uh, my service line under Zoom Plus Prime is what it's called, or Zoom Prime, um, and that's the that's the primary care adult primary care service line. Um, you can also go to zoomcare.com/prime, um, and that would also take you to um, the scheduling for um, our clinic as well. The phone number is I think it's eight four four nine six 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 seven seven seven. And that's, Could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, uh, it's uh, eight four four nine six 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 seven seven seven. 
is the is the uh, is the company's 800 number um, that people can call and schedule through there too. I think the easiest way is always kind of online or through the um, through the our, our app um, app that they have as well. Right, right. I have put that in the screen. I know of a couple of people that have already uh, mentioned that uh, through my Facebook page and an an email that they're looking forward to becoming your patient. So that's great. Uh, So it must be a challenge to get a patient who has never heard about a plant-based diet, who's coming to see you thinking that uh, they're going to get the traditional approach. How do you handle that challenge? Um, I mean, I think that it's, um, I mean, when I meet a patient, I mean, the first thing that I think um, that I try to kind of go through with them is really just trying to discuss the overall medical condition and kind of the approach that they've taken so far, um, just kind of getting to know. And, you know, a lot of people, the kind of traditional um, practice has been to start medications, control the numbers. But unfortunately, rarely do we see people actually improve their health with these. They may improve their numbers. Um, but the marginal effects that, that people get in the long-term outcomes is something that I don't think people are necessarily aware of. Um, and then even looking at some of the, you know, some of the medications that, um, you know, that we have, I mean, oftentimes the best results that we get is one person out of a hundred is getting benefit from these. And so I like to go through some of these, th- some of these, inf- some of this information with uh, my patients, um, when, when we kind of start kind of just setting up the playing field. Um, and really trying to encourage them to really take a different kind of mindset around their condition, whether it be diabetes, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, and reframing, focusing more on the cause and the root cause of things, and trying to refocus things just on lifestyle. Then after we've kind of we've we've kind of started to open that conversation and started to make that um, started having that discussion about um, lifestyle, and with, and to be honest, I think most people actually are are. In this day and age, I think people are actually pretty aware of the futility of a lot of our medications um, perform and a lot of the medical care that we do in chronic care management. So it's not too much of a leap for people to really come to that. And you know, oftentimes patients are um, extremely relieved when I tell them, you know, that you know that's not my first approach. That's not really the direction I want to go in. The challenge then comes into, well, what do we need to do to uh, do otherwise? Um, and so there's kind of three different type of people that I meet that are interested in lifestyle changes. There's the type of person that knows what they want to do, may not necessarily be what I would recommend, but they know what they want to do and they really just need some encouragement. They really just need kind of a kick in the butt. Um, and then there's a second type of person that, you know, they're really motivated. They really want to do something different. They don't really know what to do. They either need, you know, guidance to, um, you know, either watch, like a movie like Forks Over Knives or go to, you know, my dad's website or Forks Over Knives website um, just to get some information um, about either some from different books or different perspectives, some recipes. And then there's people that just run with it after that. And then there's a third type of person that really needs, needs more structure and needs more kind of a prescriptive nature. So needing a program like what we do here or my dad's immersion program or other immersion programs that are around the country to give people that more prescriptive and guidance, guidance nature. And so it, I think that those are kind of the ways to kind of help people kind of move along in, in that direction. And it kind of depends on the type of person that it is. Um, I think that things like ongoing support can be helpful for people. Um, and so that's one of the things I try to incorporate um, in what we do here in the outpatient practice is having that kind of touch points, whether it be in a group visit or whether it be in a one-on-one individual basis as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but to actually make it to, encourage people to make that change it really comes from that internal motivation and you know what i've learned kind of a couple of things i mean it's similar things that my mentors have told me before is that there's you know certain types of motivations that are strong motivators and certain types types of motivators that aren't necessarily as strong um i remember one of the things that uh from dr dean ornish he he said in one of his lectures and it's something that speaks really true to um, what i've seen as well is that fear is not the greatest motivator so trying to scare somebody into uh, making these changes doesn't usually um, have lasting uh, um, uh, lasting results. Um, other things that I have seen that aren't the greatest motivators are things like um, oftentimes when people are only looking just to lose weight because there's so many different ways to lose weight. If they can either do it by taking a pill or you know maybe having a surgery done 
or not necessarily giving up all their favorite foods um, that they've you know grown up loving, um, that can seem a little bit more easy for them to um, to do. So I don't haven't found that to be the, uh, a good motivator. Or withholding something, so withholding like a surgery or withholding something until they lose this weight or doing something, I haven't found that to be a good motivator. The best motivators have really been things like you know. Um, I don't want to. I, I don't. I don't want to feel sick anymore. Um, I don't want to feel unwell. I don't want to. I don't want to end up like my, you know, mom and dad or my grandma and grandpa. Or uh, I just want to feel better. Or I want to get on the ground and play with my grandkids. You know, things that are just they have a kind of a different uh, mindset um, of making these type of changes. Right, like right, lifestyle. Like lifestyle. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Well, we well, will we open, open, open the chat. chat. Box, box. Uh, so, so, so that people can uh, type questions. I do have a, a few questions from uh, a few people, the kind of fun trivia questions that I want to ask you really quick. You don't have to expand too much, and then we can go into more medical uh, type questions. Um, would you uh, tell us what it was like to grow up with uh, two of the most prestigious and admired people in the plant-based world, your father, John McDougall, and your mother, Mary McDougall? Well, I think, you know, as a kid, you, you probably don't really even uh, realize or grasp that um, kind of idea of what, what that means, you know, what it means that your, you know, your dad's written books or had, you know, been on TV or a radio show. I just, it, it, um, it probably see, it seems more like the norm. I mean, you know, but so I don't think I really completely grasped it in that, in that sense. And also, I, you know, as a kid, I remember, I mean, I didn't really even think much of the fact that, you know, that we just eat plants at home, you know, and, you know, whole grains and legumes. It just didn't really like, you know, capture until you start going to school and you have other people kind of make comments is the only time I think that you start kind of realizing that things are a little bit different. But, you know, it never, I don't know, it, it just didn't really bother me. I mean, I, you know, I think that part of that is, you know, the way that my mom and dad uh, kind of had, um, you know, how the household was set up is that it really wasn't like a dictatorship or, you know, forced upon me. It's just that this is what we eat at home. This is what we bring into the household. Um, but, you know, what, as I got older and what I did on my own, it wasn't really like, you know, that I was punished or anything like that. You know, if I was at a friend's house and I ate, so, you know, it was, it was more like, you know, okay, you know, but this is what we have at home. You know, we have beans and rice and, you know, and vegetables and this is right. just what we eat. Um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of how I've, you know, how I grew up and, you know, really trying to treat whatever it may be, whether it be sweets or meat or dairy or other type of rich foods have always been treated as delicacies in my household um, as I grew up. And it's the same way that I um, do the same thing with my kids. You know, it's not, you know, it's just that this is what we eat at home. We have, you know, beans and rice and pastas and, you know, vegetables and, you know, that's what we eat. But if my daughter wants to try something, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, it's not like she's, you know, I'm never going to judge that at all. No, um, no. And it's just more treating these things as delicacies. We have, you know, cake on birthdays. We have turkey on Thanksgiving. Um, and that's just, that's how I was raised. And that's kind of the same way that I, I raise my kids as well. How many kids do you have? I have two kids. I have a, um, a three and a half, almost four year old uh, girl. And I have a boy that's uh, going to be a year this weekend. Oh, wow. That's a handful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, one question from me and then we'll open it up. What advice do you give to um, young doctors and other healthcare professionals that are just starting the career or they're start or they haven't uh, graduated yet and they really want to make a difference in the health of their patients and uh, but they do still have to go through the education that is based on other traditional approaches yeah I mean, when you when you say that it actually brings up another thing that I think about too and it kind of goes along with the lines of what I'm seeing um, in my patients as well is that I think that um, patients are very open to people are very open to the idea that you know, maybe we need to take a different approach and really focus on lifestyle first. And they've become very, you know, open to this where, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, that wasn't something that was um, as approachable to talk about or um, really bring up as a, a form of treatment as opposed to here's a medication. Um, I think the same thing has happened in the medical, uh, uh, in the medical education as well. And so, you know, I remember stories that my dad would tell me about you know, his experience with bringing up, you know, a diet uh, has anything to do with disease and he'd be, you know, laughed at. 
um, and he, you know, he'd be, you know, called crazy for the idea that what you ate has anything to do with, you know, your health. Um, that's changed. I mean, I, you know, you know, I see it in my medical education is that 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 philosophy has changed. That we really do have come to realize that you know lifestyle does play a big role. So we've made that transition. Um, I think in you know in the last 20, 30 years, I think where we're at right now is that we we just don't know what to do. And I think that's where people are. You know, they we don't have an agreement upon. I think in the medical community about what is the answer now. We, we've come to the answer that, yeah, food has something to do with it, but what food specifically? And that's where I think a lot of this debate comes in, in the media and also the medical literature as well. Even though I think that it's very clear if you take a big, big picture approach of looking at the last hundred years of nutrition literature and medical literature, is that it's pretty consistent, you know, that the, the, the literature supports that more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains, more legumes promotes better health. Um, the other shift that I've seen too is that I think that um, you know, at least in my colleagues, and you know, when I went through residency, is that we have come to the idea that um, there is a lot of futility in what we do, and it doesn't necessarily um, make big changes and big outcome differences in uh, in what we do. So I think that a lot of you know new doctors and new um, residents, you know, come out of medical school. You know, some of them uh, a little bit more, um, you know, uh, feeling like they, you know, they, they don't know what to do. But I think a lot of that opens up the idea of, hey, you know, there is this idea of lifestyle medicine and really focusing on, you know, food as medicine. Um, and they're very open to that idea. Um, for people that have kind of, you know, uh, you know, been bitten by the bug of food as medicine and plant-based nutrition, um, and, you know, they a lot of times, oftentimes are challenged by time limitations um, of uh, office visits or other type of practice constraints that they don't feel like they have enough time to be able to um, be able to uh, educate their patients or share, share this, you know, great wealth of information about how they can improve their health. Um, so things that I've kind of suggested to people over the years um, and you know, for people that are in, um, you know, whether they're in residency or whether they are in a private practice um, and they feel this constraint in time is that, you know, just suggest to the patient, recommend a book, recommend a movie, just be like, hey, you know, why don't you go home and watch Forks Over Knives? If you have any questions, let me know. Or, you know, somebody who has heart disease, you know, be like, I got this great book. It's called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. Take a look. Um, you know, it's just giving them, just kind of opening the door and just kind of inviting them, you know, inviting them to start having this conversation about food. Um, but it can take two minutes just to kind of start start bringing this up and, and, and starting this conversation. And you'll, you'll find that, you know, probably one out of 10 people will really start, to, you know, listening and start taking an approach. And, you know, that doesn't seem like much, but it, it really is very rewarding when you start having more and more of these people um, start listening um, over time. You know, if it's one in 10, then maybe it's, um, you know, then you have a thousand patients, you know, where they're up to a hundred people that you really change their life. Mm -hmm. The, um, the other thing that I've suggested, I said, one of my, one of my good friends and colleagues uh, is actually, he's an in, inpatient hospitalist. And I've also suggested this to a surgeon colleague of mine too, is that you have a captured audience when somebody's in the hospital. Um, you know, why not suggest uh, they watch Forks Over Knives while they're in the hospital or, you know, you, you suggest a website. So I've actually had, one of my surgeon friends actually has purchased extra copies and he actually has been giving it to patients while they're in the hospital recovering. And then I've had pay, uh, my, one of my other good colleagues, he actually has on his discharge summary, the, the after visit summary that you give instructions to patients. Um, in the instructions that he gives them, he, um, he actually has like information about like, hey, watch this movie, go to this website, um, just to kind of uh, bring that up to them. Oh, wonderful. Wow. Very good. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, Dr. McDougall, uh, just a couple of questions, quick questions, and then we open the, the chat here. Uh, uh, someone wrote about uh, this lady who had, um, a, a, not a serious case, but she had a melanoma, a very small uh, spot uh, down her leg, and her doctor has told her that uh, vitamin D is one of the vitamins that really is important for fighting cancer and he has prescribed um i think i'm uh, quite 
the large doses of vitamin D. What is your view on this vitamin D issue? I mean, to my knowledge, vitamin D supplementation has not had outcome data to, uh, to suggest that it changes, it changes the difference of mortality from cancer or whether even incidence of cancer. Um, there's a lot more associations with vitamin D levels um, than of actually a po uh, and then vitamin D supplementation fixing those problems. Like for example, the, you know, low vitamin D levels have basically been associated with basically everything across the board you can find. I mean, whether it be a higher risk of heart disease, higher risk of cancer, but conversely, I mean, like, you know, you would, people think that like, you know, um, you can infer from that, that if I just re replace it, then obviously that would, re that would decrease that risk um, and decrease the risk of heart disease or cancer and so on and so forth. But to my knowledge, that hasn't been shown. You know, even though we may have seen the, these, you know, these associations with lower levels in the blood, we haven't seen the, the converse, which is that if I replace it with pills, then I get the, the, the opposite effect. So, I mean, I think that there's just a lot of other things that contribute to vitamin D levels. So, for example, as people um, get heavier, their vitamin D level goes down because the vitamin D gets stored in their, their fat cells. Well, we also know that obesity is associated with higher risk of cancer and melanoma and you know heart disease so what came first and what was it what was the specific cause we also know that chronic inflammation lowers vitamin d levels too so chronic inflammation like arthritis or heart disease or diabetes i mean so there's just a lot of these other things that we're not taking into a fact into account when we're talking about vitamin d levels so that's why i'm very cautious about vitamin d supplementation and the benefits that are claimed because i don't think that those things have been well worked out yet Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, someone here uh, asked a question. He said, if you could please, if it's possible to give a yes or no answer. I'm not sure if this is possible, but here's the question. Does a plant-based diet uh, center about around uh, starches like your father um, promotes increase triglycerides? So simple, uh, simple sugars um so like things like fruits or processed foods or um other type of like um like uh sh basically short uh short uh, uh sugars can raise triglyceride levels um what you know in the study that my dad and i uh published we found that people who had uh elevated triglyceride levels eating a starch-based plant-based diet their triglyceride levels uh you know dropped tremendously um, i mean i had a patient the other day i remember she had a triglyceride level of eight 800 or 850 and you know the next check a couple weeks later was 450 um, So I mean like it's very common that you'll find triglyceride levels will drop um, Very well on a plant-based diet um, Oils and other fats are other pr primary reasons that triglyceride levels are elevated and so you know what I do is I Recommend a standard, you know, starch-based, plant-based diet for my patients. I watch their triglyceride levels. If they find that they are, um, you know, if they're elevated after they've removed the processed foods, they added oils, the animal fats, um, and their triglyceride levels are still elevated, I will recommend that they cut down to a, a smaller amount of fruit intake and limit refined, uh, refined uh, carbohydrates. Right. Okay. Very good. One more question before we do the... Uh, chat here what can be done uh, on the issue of sagging skin this is uh, was a question presented by a, a lady that lost a lot of weight and mm -hmm. that's a, this question um, I mean if it's a very significant I mean surgery would be one way of doing uh, would, would be take that would probably be the only way of really taking care of it um, right. probably other ways, but surgery would be one way of doing it um, I don't see it as often um, as when people do lose weight using um, a, you know, a starch-based, plant-based diet. Um, and that's because it's a little bit slower. It's also done, I think, in a more natural, um, a natural way of doing it. So it allows the skin to be able to heal and shrink down. And so I don't see large, like, skin folds and skin flaps in most people that lose a lot amount of weight. Um, but if there is significant amounts, um, is surgery would be one way of doing it. Um, there may be other ways that I'm just not, not as familiar with either. All right, all right. Um, feel free to, uh, some of these questions, I know that may be a little bit too specific. Um, feel free to, to let me know if you want me to move on to another type of question. But here's one 
um, by Kim. What would you recommend for someone showing some signs of autoimmune disease? Diseases, a lot of joint pain, inflammation, probably leaky gut, and the yeast overgrowth. Yeast other than candida. Would you, uh, root vegetables need to be avoided for a bit? I mean, I don't know of any specifically of root vegetables that need to be avoid, avoided. Um, you know, I mean, like, I know that people talk about nightshades as kind of one of the things. I mean, I think that um, typically kind of my progression through, like, you know, di diet is that, you know, I recommend a kind of a standard, you know, starch-based, plant-based diet, you know, minimizing, um, you know, um, added sugar and added salt and no oil um, and mi minimally processed uh, foods. Um, that's kind of my starting place. And then if, if people aren't having completely relief from that, my next step is to remove gluten. And so wheat, barley, and rye, I remove those from the diet and see how that kind of um, takes the next effect. If that doesn't seem to resolve, re resolve the symptoms, whether they be allergies, joint pains, people sometimes doing an elimination diet can be beneficial. And then you can find out what specifically um, you know, is the culprit. Um, and, you know, sometimes it is the nightshade family, which are, you know, the, the potatoes and tomatoes and eggplants. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, you know, I don't usually just start there. Um, I usually kind of take a stepwise approach of the more likely culprits, which are oftentimes like dairy and eggs and meat. Um, and, you know, and then gluten is, is another one that is, probably, you know, the next step on the lower, lower of the list. Why would, um, going back to the previous question, why would fresh fruit be, uh, someone is asking, bad for triglycerides. It, it, she says that, or he, um, maybe he can see how oils could be bad, but why fruit? Uh, it's just that the liver produces the fat from the simple sugars, is what, what happens. Is I think it's specifically the, um, I'd have to go back. I, I think I want to say it's the fructose in it, but I, I might be incorrect about that. Um, but yes, the simple sugars do seem to get converted into um, triglycerides from the, um, in the liver. Right. right. Okay, how, how long does it take for someone with diabetes to see uh, a change in, in numbers once they start a switch to a completely plant-based, all-free diet? I'm usually within about two to three days. Um, uh, so I see people get um, a, lot, a lot of drop in their blood sugars in about two to three days. Um, it is, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, I, oftentimes I have to decrease insulin levels within two to three days, somewhere between 20% uh, to 30% sometimes. Um, but people can have quite significant drops. I mean, when, when you know, I, I remember times, you know, when I was working at my dad's program, within seven days, I mean, I'll see drops anywhere from 50 to 100 points. Um, you know, there's patients that I've taken through with my program here, seeing, you know, on average, usually about 50 to 100 points after about three weeks or so. Um, but it does happen pretty quickly, even without the weight loss. And then I don't see that people completely reverse it completely, you know, like in the first like couple of days. I mean, there, there's some effect just by the food that people are eating that's going to raise those blood sugars. And that gets changed when you start changing your diet. But then there's the other added effect of actually all the fat storage that needs to come off that's contributing to the insulin resistance. And so over time, as people are losing weight, their insulin resistance will continue to improve and help improve their blood sugars and their handling of sugar. Because diabetes is more of a sugar handling problem, not a too much sugar problem. And so it's just about how they're handling sugar and, and the fat that people eat and the fat that people wear are two of the bigger bigger contributors to the um, to the sugar handling problem. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Uh, someone says here that we're already following the starch solution. Which foods within that help heartburn and chronic pain? Like what foods like help specifically or? Uh, I wait, maybe we should ask this person uh, to see who is this. Um, Paul. I would say, maybe I would we should ask Paul to clarify. <laughs> I would think, think about switching it around a little bit and think about more of what foods can like on a plant based diet could be contributing to heartburn. Um, and I would encourage you know that the uh, listener to um, my dad wrote a great article in his newsletter called "My Stomach's on Fire." Um, and I can't put it out, I think is what it's called, but, um, it, but it talks about things like, you know, citrus foods, uh, licorice, um, peppermint, um, what other things, chocolate, uh, caffeine, those type of things that are still plant-based that could be contributing to, um, continued, um, reflux type of symptoms. 
if people do have what's called a hiatal hernia, and if that they developed a hiatal hernia before they change their diet because of, you know, oftentimes it's because of chronic constipation and that pressure of pushing the stomach up, they can develop a hiatal hernia and that will lead to chronic uh, reflux even after you've changed your diet as well. But, you know, it, it's, it's going to continue to, um, you know, oftentimes people do see a lot of benefit um, even if they do have that from their dietary changes. But eliminating those things like, you know, the uh, citrus, uh, citrus foods and the peppermints and the, uh, you know, and chocolate and, the, and coffee and caffeine um, can, can, uh, can be helpful. Right, right. Um, everybody, I, there are so many questions. We could be here for three hours. So we're, I'm sorry, we're going to choose the, the, some of them. If you want to email questions, you can always email them to me at webinars at drmcdougall.com and I save those questions for webinars, webinars later. Uh, Dr. McDougall, one question that I think a lot of people are having is, what do you do when someone is plant-based they don't have, they don't consume any oil and the cholesterol is still high. What kind of uh, measurement do you, do you take? Do you look at their diet more closely or do you prescribe any medication? I mean, it just kind of depends. I mean, like, so when I look at like, first I kind of take a step back and I say, well, why do we even care about cholesterol levels? So cholesterol levels, why do I care about them is that they are increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes. But there's also a lot of other things that contribute to heart attacks and strokes. So besides high cholesterol levels, also high blood pressure, high blood sugar, increased weight, poor diet, sedentary activity, smoking, family history, and there's probably a couple other ones that I'm missing as well. But so what, how I look at when people are trying to change their diet and they've changed their diet and the cholesterol level is not coming down, is everything else that we, we may have control over optimized? So is my weight optimized? Is my exercise optimized? Is I'm not smoking? Is my blood sugar optimized? Is my blood pressure optimized? Because then if everything else is optimized, the risk that that cholesterol level that is elevated, probably based on genetics, um, is gonna be very minimal. Now, if you want the absolute most risk reduction that you can have, maybe taking a cholesterol medication may decrease that another small fraction um, if, they're looking, if they're looking for that extra risk reduction. But I'd say just kind of looking at how do I reduce the risk the most? You got to look at the big picture of things. And so that's the approach that I take in the conversation that I have is, you know, are we doing everything else? If we are, then how worried are we at this level? Um, and so I would just kind of look at all those type of different type of things. Right, right. Uh, someone here is asking about, um, have you had cases where people uh, have uh, kind of severe cases of constipation, even though they eat a lot of potatoes and rice and beans. And what would you suggest for someone who is suffering with that? Add more insoluble fiber. Okay, more fiber. In insoluble. So there's two different types of fiber. There's soluble and insoluble fiber. Typically, soluble fiber is going to slow things down a little bit more. Insoluble fiber might speed things up a little bit more. And so I find that, you know, that when people do have the uh, a little bit slower bowels, and they want to speed it up a little bit more. So adding some more insoluble fiber can help kind of uh, regulate things a little bit more. Right. What, what, what examples do you give of insoluble fiber? Okay. Well, now, now I'm going to have to take a look here. <laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. While, um, while you take a look, um, someone is asking about drinking decaf coffee. Having heard your dad, your father, uh, he says that it raises cholesterol. Um, what um, do you think that it interferes with a plant-based diet? Um, so yeah, loss? I remember reading that in my dad, um, one of my dad's earlier books. Um, I don't hear it talked about as much, but um, it's something on the coating of the bean. Is my understanding that does raise cholesterol levels um, of the coffee bean, and I believe it occurs whether you you drink caffeinated or decaf. Um, that it's both both of those could contribute to elevated cholesterol levels. Do you even recommend people drinking coffee or tea? Um, I think that you know <laughs> I think tea has some benefits that can come come with it. Um, I was just reading Dr. Greger's new book and uh, he talks a little bit about some benefits of actually even drinking coffee. Um, and so you know I don't necessarily know you know how horrible it is. You know as long as your cholesterol levels and blood pressure looks okay, and uh, you know it's maybe not horrible. Um, I think that um, oftentimes you know it's what people put in their coffee is probably more more of a contributor to uh, poor health than really probably the coffee beans themselves. Um, but you know it, it's a um, somewhat considered a drug, uh, you know a vice. 
And so you just have to kind of think about those things as well. Do you have an opinion regarding uh, CoQ10? I don't know a lot about it. I think there was a recent article that didn't really show much benefit by taking it. Um, and it, 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 was, it was just published, I think, about a month ago. Um, right. okay. I, don't of, I don't have a lot of opinions, but... Um, All right. We'll uh, some Linda is asking, what uh, was your favorite type of dinner? Oh, I only eat five, five different things. So I eat very, very simply. <laughs> um, always my favorite is beans and rice. Uh, you know, like I love, you know, beans, bean and rice bowls with some salsa and corn, uh, tomatoes, some lettuce sometimes, um, avocado slices. That's like one of my favorites. Do you uh, eat brown rice or white rice? Or it doesn't it matter. I, I, I eat a mixture of both. I, I try to eat mostly all, all brown rice. Um, but if the white rice is all I have available, it's not. I don't look at it as a deal breaker. Um, but I do try to eat mostly brown rice and whole grain uh, noodles. Um, I always try to eat as most uh, whole as I can. All right. All right. Uh, another one of my favorite ones uh, is we do uh, soba noodles with a miso soup, like a miso soup with a soba noodles with spinach and tofu and mushrooms. And we do sometimes sweet potato, brown, uh, like uh, boiled sweet potatoes in it too. Um, and that's one of my favorite ones. Um, but yeah, I, I eat pretty simply and pretty consistently. Um, and why do I do that? Is I just, I just think it, it's more predictable of what it's going to do to my weight, cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, and just keep me very, very um, keeps me consistent and keeps me on my path by having a very kind of narrow um, repertoire of what I eat. Right, right. Someone is asking about the title of the book by Dr. Uh, Gregor. I think is how to not die. How not to die. How not to die. How okay. not, it's a very good book. I mean, he is, a, he, is a, he is entertaining, and he really digests a lot of information into um, it. Into, um, I mean, it's just very digestible. I, I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was a great book. Yes, I, I got it, and it really is. Um, I am typing it here so people can see it. And, of course, I, we recommend highly the Start Solution, which, uh, of course, is written by your father and he's working on a new book yeah uh, I, I, are you ever are you thinking of writing a book anytime I don't know I don't think <laughs> so, but, okay. uh, you know it's something that I debate about but it's really just not you know it's not really my interest right now I mean I'm uh, I'm very uh, very busy you know with, with uh, the practice and still right. practicing medicine um, really enjoy seeing patients and you mm -hmm. know running my practice um, and so I'm just I'm not there yet. I mean, maybe after I have 10 to 15 years, you know, of doing this under my belt, maybe I'll have feel like I have something that would be unique enough to share. But it's just, you know, there's just so many so many books out there now, and you know, basically anybody's writing books and yes. you know, share any type of opinion that they have. And so I just um, I just feel like you know the the difference I can make right now is just seeing patients and building a practice that I can see even more patients and train providers. Um, and you know, that's my goal is one of the goals of why I joined this practice and this company is really to try to create a model that can be replicated. And so that's one of our goals is really to try to create a practice that can be replicated anywhere. Yes. All right. Uh, Dr. McGoogle, I'm going to ask you one more question. Then we will have to, to uh, close this webinar. And I hope that you will consider being a guest sometime in the near future because people are really enjoying hearing from you. Good. Okay. Uh, so can you please tell me, says Melanie, what causes inflammation? Uh, many different things cause inflammation. I mean, it could be anything from smoking to pollutants to, you know, fat, you know, saturated fat. I mean, there's, I don't think we completely understand all the different things that cause inflammation, but I think it's a great question. I think, you know, oftentimes people say inflammation causes this disease. True. But what caused the inflammation? what was the actual event that's causing the trigger um, of this inflammation from occurring? And I think that, you know, like my dad has always said, the thing that we're most exposed to is the food. I mean, that's where most of our exposure to the environment is through the food. So whether it be from additives in the food or whether it be from, you know, antibiotics in the meat or pollutants in the meat or other type of things that, you know, come in our food or pesticides or, you know, fats and proteins. I mean, all those things potentially could be triggers of inflammation. Um, in the body um, and I think that's what we need to more focus on as opposed to how do I cut down this inflammation by pills or 
whatever it may be, we need to really focus on what's causing this inflammation in the first place. And I don't think that's the question or the conversation that's being had oftentimes. Um, we know of one, which is smoking, and that causes inflammation. Very good. Well, um, we will close for today. Next week, please, everybody register for Dr. Lyle's um, webinar. And the following week, Dr. John McDougall will be back. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Craig McDougall. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, everybody, you can actually age backwards if you eat plants and if you eat starches. So with that thought of uh, aging backwards, I leave you all and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you.